Um, yes, next slide, please. So site news, so COVID has really hit us for a loop. Uh, the restrictions require a two week quarantine before we can even get up to Tulik. Uh, so for the last two years, we've uh, sent uh, sort of a reduced crew up there and they've been able to maintain the long-term experiments and, and do all the measurements for our long-term monitoring. <clears throat> However, we're not able to accomplish a lot of the things we had planned to do. Um, foremost in my mind is a harvest of some of our terrestrial plots that requires a large group of people to go up for about two weeks, um, work intensively and then come back out. So most of these people are volunteers. So it just wasn't feasible to send that group up for the last two years. And it doesn't look particularly good for next year either. Um, so the big news is that the Arctic LTER will be transferred to Columbia as of January uh, with uh, Kevin Griffin as the lead and uh, Natalie Goldman and Duncan Mengi will also be joining the team uh, with that transfer. All right, so I wanna tell you about um, a cross-site uh, study that we've done. Uh, we used the MEL model, which is a biogeochemical model to do some simulations at eight LTER sites plus uh, Kashwana down in the Brazilian Amazon. Um, there are actually uh, four Arctic sites that I've, been, that I've worked on, but I'm only showing the tussock tundra and there are two boreal sites. I'm only showing the upland uh, boreal site on these, uh, these graphs. So these are, uh, well, the first thing you learn when you try to do this kind of thing is that assembling a carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and water budget for all these sites is uh, quite a lot of work. And um, we weren't completely successful, but we were able to patch the holes by, uh, uh, getting similar sites and, and doing some extrapolations. So what you're looking at are, uh, so it's, a, it, it's really a heuristic exercise because of that difficulty in assembling data. And the question we were addressing is uh, how do ecosystem characteristics constrain the response to climate change? So these, these simulations are 100 year simulations where we doubled CO2, increased warming by three and a half degrees, and increased precipitation by 20% at the end of the growing season. And all of these changes were done uh, linearly over time, over the 100 years. <clears throat> and all of the sites gain carbon between one and 11%. Um, the major mechanism for these sites is uh, a transfer of nitrogen and phosphorus from soil that have a low C to N, low C to P, to vegetation that have the higher C than and C to P. Uh, for ecosystems that we assumed to have end fixation, like the NIWAT one up the, the top, uh, end fixation contributed uh, significantly to that uh, storage. Um, other, uh, you know, the, especially the uh, less woody sites, um, the uh, increase in productivity also increased the soil C than and C to P. So uh, this we've submitted to ecological applications. You can see the authors down there at the lower uh, right. So this now is just some simulations with the same model, but only at uh, uh, Tulik for the tussock tundra. And the question we're asking is the importance of variability. So these simulations have no climatic trend. They just have a, uh, a change in the variability in uh, precipitation and in temperature. And so what I did was uh, I built a, uh, a uh, weather generator based on our uh, long-term climate data at Tulik. That's uh, shown over on the left in the blue. And um, I've included the total shortwave because there's a, a small um, relationship between uh, the total radiation and uh, the precipitation. And uh, so in green is uh, having the variance in the, uh, in the uh, weather data and in red, you're doubling the variance in the, in the uh, uh, precipitation and uh, uh, temperature max and min data. 
And then over on the right are the results of, again, a constant mean climate, but just increasing or decreasing the uh, variance uh, in, uh, in, in the uh, precipitation and temperature. And you can see that the vegetation loses a lot of, uh, of carbon when you increase the variance. Uh, the soil loses a lot of carbon. The ecosystem loses a lot of carbon. So what we're suspecting is that the increase in climate variability should uh, negate the gains in carbon associated with elevated CO2 and warming trends. Now, the reason for these, this pattern is that uh, uh, if you have a Q10 function like you have in respiration, a one degree deviation in the positive degradation positive direction has a much stronger effect than a one degree deviation in the negative direction. And for um, asymptotic or unimodal properties like photosynthesis, photosynthesis tends to be closer to the optimum temperature. You don't have that. So the, the respiration tends to dominate. And also the increase in uh, variability in precipitation tends to wash out any nutrients that uh, are in the soil when you have the, the large um, uh, rainfall events. So <clears throat> up at the top is our conceptual diagram or conceptual model for the existing LTER going from uh, the terrestrial system where the nutrient cycles are fairly tight, so fairly closed. Um, because of that closure, they're weakly uh, connected spatially. Uh, relative to the streams on the far uh, right, which are very open systems in terms of nutrients and they're strongly connected to one another. And we think that the lakes are probably somewhere in between. And I showed you the effects of climate trends. And I also showed you the effects of uh, climate variability. So um, what we're working on for our renewal is uh, the hypothesis that, um, that a highly variable um, climate is going to have a very strong influence on uh, Arctic carbon balance. And that's all I have. Thank you.